Cool. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. We're right at the start time at two o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, first off, good afternoon. I'm Jason Thomas. I'm a project engineer here at America Makes, and I will be your host for today's uh, America Makes TRX webinar series. Little background on the TRX webinar series before I introduce our speakers. Uh, as America Makes continues its, its mission to expand and ex accelerate the footprint of additive manufacturing and 3D printing, this medium called the America Makes Technical Review and Exchange Webinar Series was created. By creating this platform, it allows the additive manufacturing and 3D printing community to come together and share knowledge and experience with the broader community. If you or your team are interested in presenting in our TRX webinar series, please navigate to americamakes.us, click on the membership tab, and scroll down to TRX webinar series to fill out the request form. Alternatively, you can contact the America Makes TRX webinar series administrator, myself, Jason Thomas, directly at jason.thomas at ncdmm.org. Few important notes before we kick off the series. At the end of the presentation today, there will be an opportunity for a brief question and answer session. If during the presentation you do have a question, please submit it in the Teams chat and I'll ask it during the Q&A session. I will do my best to get all of your answers or all of your questions answered. Today's webinar is from filament to finished product, navigating reliability and performance challenge in FDM printing. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Slice Engineering CEO and co-founder Dan Barouse and president of Lulzbot, John Olhoff. Dan is a mechanical engineer who turned to the dark side of business in sales and marketing when he started Slice Engineering. He is passionate about using 3D printing as a tool to help people bring their ideas to life. John Olhoff believes the ability to rapidly manufacture and validate parts with 3D printing will usher in a new era of innovation and discovery. In turn, products will gain efficiency and improve time to market, whether it be agricultural equipment, prosthetic limbs, space exploration tools, or beyond. John brings this vision to life daily as president of the 3D printer manufacturer, Lulzbot, which is based in Fargo, North Dakota. John holds a master's degree in business administration from North Dakota State University and a bachelor's degree in agricultural and biosystems engineering. So without further ado, Dan and John, I'll now turn it over to you and your team. Go ahead and take it away, gentlemen. Thanks, Jason. Really appreciate the intro there. Uh, I am really excited to be sharing this today with the whole crew here. Uh, excited to be a part of the TRX webinar. We've worked with America Makes for a while now and uh, really pumped to be on the platform, being able to talk about some of our solutions as well as uh, how to implement filament uh, products into a final component that can be used in the real world. Uh, if I stumble over my words a little bit today, I'm, uh, I am an engineer. I promise I can speak, but uh, I also have a two week old at home. so trying to balance the uh, lack of sleep and also presenting at the same time. So a little roadmap of what we're gonna be doing today, what we're gonna be talking about today is of course, why adopting additive manufacturing is actually can be very difficult. Uh, but we're also gonna talk about what we can do to overcome some of those challenges. And then my favorite part, of course, at the end is talking about some case studies, real life, applications of how people are doing that in the field. So a little bit about us. If I can get this slide to advance, there we go. Uh, why you should care who we are and what we're talking about. Um, we're a startup based out of Gainesville, Florida, as Jason alluded to. We make components for industrial 3D printing applications. And the reason we're doing this is because we really believe that 3D printing technology has the potential to change a lot of things in the world for better. We call that uh, printing dreams. And, but there's still a lot of variability inherent in this technology. And so we're here to try and solve that. A lot of us came from a former medical device background. So I kind of, me and my co-founder started this and then stole some folks from the company we used to work at. And our whole goal has been to take those same principles that we had in medical device manufacturing and really transport them into additive uh, to create an environment where you've got reliability, performance, and support in a platform that's able to be scalable. Uh, the way we're kind of approaching that is we 
just recently in April got the first FDA process validated print head for implantable medical devices, which we're very excited about. And very soon we will have the first um, mill standard qualified or certified uh, print head uh, available anywhere in the world. So very excited about that. We're of course a member of America Makes and we're on the GSA schedule as well. We work in a variety of different industry verticals. So no matter what industry vertical you are in, in particular additive manufacturing can be applicable for your application. There is a way to make it work. Uh, it's just a matter of figuring out, okay, what is the right way to do it? It's so a little bit about AM. Obviously, additive manufacturing makes the news a lot. It is uh, kind of a, a deep tech, you know, exciting topic to talk about. But on the global scale of manufacturing output, it is really, really, really tiny. So you can see global economic output last year, about $100 trillion. Many total manufacturing output is a relatively small portion of that, $16 trillion. And then Orders of magnitude smaller, we've got $16 billion last year in total additive manufacturing. So it's still a very, very tiny market. Uh, but what's exciting about that is there's a lot of ways to continue to grow this space and find new applications where uh, you can shorten things like time to market, uh, increase customization, and really provide a better total outcome for uh, the end customer. So I asked uh, ChatGPT, couldn't do something, you know, in this day and age without ChatGPT involvement. So I asked ChatGPT, what were the main barriers to additive manufacturing adoption? And the answers are actually pretty good. And uh, so I took that and looked at what do we experience in our own facility, as well as what do our customers give us in terms of feedback, and narrowed that down to five factors that we really believe are preventing uh, scalability in adopting additive manufacturing. So that's, of course, this uh, performance aspect where you have material or mechanical limitations where the product or the input, basically input material is not really providing mechanical properties you might need on the back end or the speed aspect, right? You may need to produce 10,000 of something and injection molding might be a better way to do that. You know, and, and there are cases where, of course, the traditional technologies are the right tool. Uh, but additive should be a tool in your toolbox for most applications. Uh, another one that I hear a lot is quality and consistency. If you're familiar with 3D printed parts, they have layer lines, right? And that's not something that people are potentially used to seeing. Or maybe the part doesn't behave to specification due to uh, you know, variability from one printer to the next or from one run on the same printer to the next. So that's another major issue. Uh, Post-processing, if you're familiar again with multiple 3D printing technologies, some of them have very long post-processing times, sometimes days after the part is printed where you need to post-process in order to get something actually useful. And then lastly, knowledge, right? Skill set and education is definitely a major thing that is preventing further adoption. So the reason I think filament is a great option for a lot of use cases is that it's really the simplest additive manufacturing technology to use, to educate someone on, going back to that education component there, and also to deploy at any scale. The systems in general are relatively inexpensive as compared to some of the other technologies out there. And so you can deploy them at scale. Going over to each of those things that was on, on that uh, kind of circle earlier, I want to talk about each of them in a little bit more depth and then say, okay, how have we sort of accepted this challenge to overcome that limitation with new technologies? Uh, there's obviously a lot of talented people across the whole field that are working on this stuff to address these challenges. So challenge accepted, here we go. All right, so why, again, why FDM? So materials are similar or the same in FDM or MX material extrusion or FFF fused filament fabrication, all the same technology. The materials are typically the same as you would see with plastic injection molding. And so the pellet feedstock that is used to make filament is gonna be the same as the pellet feedstock that you would use 
for various injection molding technologies that have been around for a long time. And so those materials are well characterized. They are they have known mechanical properties and uh, you know things like thermal expansion coefficients and um, modulus. Uh, so all of that data can be address used to identify or narrow down the right material to address a challenge uh, that you may have now. So that makes it an easy solution to adopt quickly. The other thing that is happening here is a lot of new materials are coming out. So these are some examples of ones that we've used with customers very recently. PCTG, you may be familiar with like PETG or PET, which is used in uh, the most common example would be like water bottles. But there's also another material called PCTG that is almost isotropic. One of the things that uh, is a Achilles heel for 3D printing is that in the Z direction, there is not the same amount of strength as you would have in the XY direction. So parts tend to be more brittle, more likely to break in the Z direction. But if you're using a material like PCTG and some others that are more isotropic, you can achieve much better Z strength and use that part in a different application where you may need uh, stronger mechanical properties in all three axes. There's also unique metal filled materials that are coming out. You may have heard of Virtual Foundry or BASF's uh, materials that have things like 316L uh, steel powder inside the plastic. Those parts can be 3D printed, sintered like some other sintering processes. And uh, of course there's a little bit of part shrinkage, but you end up with a functional part that is a metallic part that was done on an inexpensive printer, uh, desktop printer, as opposed to a much more expensive, um, you know, DMLS system, for example. It's also a lot of opportunity with flexibles. We did a project recently where the Air Force needed some um, uh, covers basically printed for an older aircraft to keep uh, nuts and bolts from falling into an engine during an engine overhaul. And they were able to print that on an FTM printer using our technologies. And that saved them one, a lot of time, but two, also prevented a potential catastrophic issue with an engine malfunction if you know parts and debris were to get inside of it during that retrofit. I'll talk more about this in detail later, but peak polyether ether ketone is a material that has been used in medical device manufacturing for a long time. Up until very recently, there was not a good solution for implanting that material when it had been 3D printed into patients, but I've got a case study about that later in the presentation that I'm really excited to talk about. Uh, and then lastly, we've got uh, plaster actually, which is kind of an odd thing, but uh, for dental work or for casts, sometimes you know a plaster mold you, you're probably all familiar with if you broke your arm as a kid, hopefully not recently. Uh, as an adult, breaking your arm is, is uh, really takes a long time to heal. Uh, but there are plaster filled materials that can be printed and then go through a, a smaller post-processing step to get a similar um, behavior, mechanical behavior to a regular plaster, but you're able to create unique geometric shapes that you wouldn't have been able to normally. And speaking of geometric shapes, uh, lattice structures are a really interesting thing that you can do with uh, 3D printing technologies that you would not be able to do necessarily with traditional parts. And that's a way that you can address strength to weight ratios or other mechanical deficiencies that you might have in a, uh, in a part where you can really overcome that challenge with a lattice structure. And this is a part that we printed with um, General Lattice. If you guys saw the, uh, the Wilson basketball thing that made the news and went viral. Uh, that was done with you know a couple different companies working together, but the lattice structure was done by General Lattice. So we've been working with them to do uh, some of these flexible printed lattice structures, uh, which are really fun. So next challenge here, uh, speed or, or time, the amount of time it takes to complete a job. Uh, there's some new software tools out there that have helped to speed up the um, 
just the print time in general, right? So a part that may have taken eight hours previously might take six, four, three hours now with just changes in, in software. And I'll touch more on this later on the control feedback side, but uh, these types of software solutions can make a huge difference in not only the speed at which a part can be printed, but also the quality with which a part can be completed. And then one of the things that we've done really to push the boundaries of how quickly things can be printed is we continue to come out with print heads that are faster and faster. So traditionally you might see uh, a print head that does you know, maybe uh, 60 to 100 grams an hour of, of material and that would be considered a, a relatively solid platform. Uh, Earlier this year, we launched this print head that is, can do up to a half a kilogram an hour, right? So five times, or in some cases, 10 times faster than what sort of the standard is. Now, it is a little bit larger, of course, so it's going to go on a larger machine platform. But the fact remains that it's still, a, it fits in the palm of my hand, right? So it's still a relatively compact product that can be deployed on a, a, desk, a large desktop machine or a, or a floor standing machine that really significantly increases the throughput. We've seen a lot of demand for these in the prosthetics industry where people are printing sockets, either lower limb or upper limb uh, for patients. So really cool technology. There's a lot, of, a lot packed into this type of thing and we're continuing to develop these types of solutions to push the boundaries of how fast you can melt plastic uh, and squirt it out of a nozzle. All right, moving on to the quality and consistency thing that I mentioned earlier with the layer lines. These are some parts that we printed as part of a, an assembly for a print head that we ship out to customers. You can see the, I'm not sure how well this is coming through virtually, but these parts look really, really good. They do have some still visible layer lines in some places, but this is a, uh, a polycarbonate uh, carbon fiber reinforced part. So you get a really high strength to weight ratio. They're very rigid. They can take impacts uh, while also in temperature, right? So a uh, high uh, heat deflection temperature for these parts, but they are also aesthetically pleasing. When we put this together as a full assembly, and ship it out to a customer, we get questions sometimes like, how, how did you print this? You know, was this printed with uh, a, a different type of technology than, than what they're used to seeing with FDM? And the answer is no, you just got to figure out how to set up your parameters correctly and use some of these other tools that I talked about with software. Or uh, another thing is make sure that your machine has the right control loop set up. So there's certain machines on the market that, um, don't do controls very well. Uh, and there are others that do closed loop feedback uh, quite well. And so you want to look at, all right, how do you spec something out for your application? If you need something that is going to get better quality and consistency that has the right control software in place to make sure that you're getting the right results. And then finally, on the consistency side and the quality side, plastic, unlike uh, Water would be the, the classic example of moving from state to state, right? You get a solid block of ice, you apply heat, turns into a liquid, and it's a, a pretty uh, linear process. Plastic doesn't behave like that. Plastic actually goes through sort of this multi-phase melting process. And so you start out in this glassy solid state. Uh, it goes into a glass transition state where you are increasing the temperature and the, the modulus or the stiffness is decreasing. Uh, if you were to touch it in that state, it's sort of sticky. Uh, and then it goes into a rubbery state for a while as the uh, heat energy being absorbed by the plastic remains static, but the module or is increasing rather, but the modulus remains static, relatively static. And at that point, it feels kind of like a, um, like al dente pasta uh, would be my best description. And then you enter this rubbery flow state where it's actually melted and then viscous flow where the material actually becomes printable and you can move around you know, rapidly with a nozzle and extrude 
this material at, uh, at a rate where it behaves how you want it to behave and you can create nice looking parts. So why this is important is that inside of a print head, there's something called a heat break. And the heat break is what controls how the plastic transitions from that solid state through those multiple phases into a printable state. And if your heat break is not particularly thermally efficient, uh, it will take a long time for, uh, a long distance rather, in time, for that plastic to convert from solid to printable. And the more time that the plastic and the more distance that that plastic spends in, in the sticky al dente or melted phase that is not printable, the more your print head is pulling and pushing on a wet noodle. And wet noodles do not respond well to forces. You know, they don't respond linearly to forces. So ideally you would have a solid uh, filament coming in and then rapidly transition from solid into printable. And we do that with uh, what's called bimetallic heat break technology. So there is a copper section in the top, a copper section in the bottom. Those that material has very good thermal conductivity. Uh, and so that allows us to transition the material, the filament from solid to printable in about a one to two millimeter uh, zone, that, that heat break zone. Other technologies might do that in five, six, 10 millimeters. And so you, that means you have five to, you know, five, six, 10 millimeters of sloppy uh, filament in your in your melt zone, and uh, and that translates into artifacts in the part and not being able to print something as cleanly. So, if you are specifying a machine, uh, if you're looking for the uh, you know a particular system to meet a need, make sure that you're getting bimetallic heat break technology and, along with some of these other things that I've talked about in your printer. All right, post processing. So nobody likes post-processing. Everybody wants it to just come right off the printer and be awesome uh, right when it comes out. Uh, and there are some ways that you can do that. So some interesting things that are happening now, you may have seen uh, a three plus one or non-planar uh, type of printing where you are, it's kind of hard to see with this image, but essentially the print head is moving in an additional axis. Uh, so it's like a three plus one axis approach, kind of similar to what you'd see on um, like an early CNC or, or table mill that allows for an additional axis to be added. Uh, that type of technology is being rolled out in firmware to some 3D printers. And that's a unique way to reduce the amount of post-processing that you need to do if you have a complex geometric shape. Taking that one step further, there are now systems that utilize a robot to have true freeform or six axis non-planar printing. And that enables a whole new suite of geometric shapes and applications where you can change uh, the orientation of your parts such that, for example, you don't need to print support material. You can do the whole thing in one shot or you can print along the stress lines of the part where you uh, are, basically using the inherent properties of the material to avoid things like the anisotropy issue with the z-axis strength not being the same as the x and y uh, axis strength. So that's a unique thing to take a look at as well. This particular system uses our uh, print head that is designed to have a protective roll cage to carry translational and rotational ro loads and also have a, a strong um, acute approach angle. So you can come in and, and print parts that have a wider range of geometries. So if you're looking at specking a robot system, make sure that the print head that's on it can handle an impact right, of the robot with the part. You don't want to smash into the part incidentally and then trash your whole system. Uh, and also can do a really acute angle. If it can't do an acute angle and fully utilize the full range of motion of the robot arm, why are you buying a robot arm, right? Just buy a, a three axis system. And then finally, uh, multi-material systems are also helping to reduce post-processing where you can 
print maybe with a support material and then the build material, or you can uh, print multicolor, right? That allows for a reduction in post-processing uh, to get you closer to the final part without spending as much time uh, in post. All right, last segment here, uh, skill sets and education. So there's some really cool things happening on the skill set and education side. Uh, the AM Forward initiative, hopefully all of you have heard about that, but essentially it's designed to increase uh, uptake in the industrial base in the United States of additive manufacturing technologies. And part of that, those funds from the federal government are slated for education. And, uh, and some of that is being pushed through America Makes. So thank you, America Makes, for doing that and helping to develop the next generation workforce. The other part of this is standardization, right? Like with any nascent industry, there's not a lot of standardization yet. And some of those standards are rolling out uh, right now. ASTM and ISO are developing new uh, standards. Uh, companies like General Lattice that I mentioned earlier with that lattice structure, they're building out uh, material repositories that can become standardized. And uh, machine manufacturers like uh, Lulzbot that we'll talk about later, they're working to standardize things across their systems so that it's easier and easier to, for a user to say, okay, I want to click, just click print and this part actually comes out how I want it to come out. And then lastly, there's of course a huge initiative for uh, STEM education in K through 12, which uh, most of the companies that I talk to in additive are doing something to support that in some way, shape or form. Our company in Florida is located near the University of Florida we work with students all the time and I go over there and, and give lectures and talk about, okay, why is additive manufacturing important? Why is manufacturing in general important, right? Why people should be still going into that field and why it's critical for us as a country, for national defense, for national security, for uh, preservation of jobs here in this country. Uh, all of that comes down to an educational mindset that starts as early as you can uh, to build it up throughout the lifetime of a person as they're making decisions about their career. All right, my favorite part, the case studies. So this first one, I alluded to this a couple of times, but Curativa Inc., it's a company out of Alabama. They are a medical device manufacturer. They've built a platform that allows for 3D printed uh, cervical spacers, uh, inner body cervical spacers, if you're not familiar with those terms, essentially just means spine surgery up here in the, in the neck area. Uh, if you get into a, God forbid, a car accident or some sort of uh, accident where you would need a spinal surgery, um, traditionally, the expectation was when you got a single level surgery, eventually, it would cause the other levels, the subsequent levels above and below to slowly degrade and you would need more follow-up surgeries. And the goal has always been to, for that not to be the case, right? To where, okay, if you've got an issue, you have a surgery once and then you're not having to repeat that surgery uh, on subsequent levels. But mechanical properties of peak and titanium implants, which are sort of the state of the art, could never really be optimally set up to mimic human bone in such a way that it did not cause the subsequent levels to break down. Well, with additive manufacturing, I've talked about, of course, the lattice structures and using that to tune the mechanical properties. Uh, Curativa was able to do that with a custom print head that we built for them. And now there've been to date about 350 surgeries where patients have received this product. Uh, and so far the results look really amazing. Um, the body is basically fully absorbing this implant and not having any mechanical uh, degradation in subsequent levels. So really, really exciting. Uh, I'm hopeful that this type of technology is gonna carry out to all of uh, orthopedics, excuse me, because it really is a life-changing thing for anybody that's going through an orthopedic surgery, which is never a fun thing to have to do. All right, I'm gonna shut up now for a minute and let uh, John take over and talk about the cool stuff that his awesome company is doing. Awesome, thank you, Dan. Um, 
Uh, as was mentioned, I'm John Olhoff, the president of Lulz Bot 3D Printers. Uh, we're up in Fargo, North Dakota, and we're the uh, largest desktop 3D printer manufacturer uh, in the United States. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, how we produce our parts, uh, the supply chain uh, resiliency, and a, a little bit about our company here. So some quick background. Uh, we've got just over uh, 42,000 uh, Lulzbot machines that are in circulation today. Uh, we've done a good job of uh, supporting our machines uh, throughout that time period of about 12 years old. Uh, so uh, 2011 is when you see Lulzbot uh, come onto the scene. Uh, we've been in Fargo now for just over the past uh, uh, four years uh, with myself at the helm. Um, we've got uh, pretty close to 50 employees here, and that's uh, something that puts us as a, a small company, but one that's still capable of getting stuff done. Um, all of our main uh, company functions are under one roof, whether that's uh, fulfillment, procurement, engineering, you name it, uh, we're all here. And then uh, we also provide that same day or next business day shipping, uh, high commitment to that. So. As uh, far as a few of our uh, customers go, um, we've got a nice uh, collection of different brand names you may uh, recognize here. Uh, we certainly like to uh, partner uh, with industry. Um, a lot of what uh, Dan talked about was that uh, just pressing print, uh, that simple to use uh, 3D printer. And that's something that we definitely agree with. Um, we tend to develop our material profiles very closely uh, with our hardware. Um, Slice Engineering has been able to help us take that to another level uh, when it comes to hardware consistencies. So uh, every day uh, we run just over 300 machines uh, that produce uh, parts for ourselves, uh, as well as we've started to do uh, some service bureau work uh, for our partners uh, utilizing this many machines. Um, across the board, uh, we've been implementing uh, the Slice Engineering hot ends uh, in our tool heads, uh, which is very nice. Uh, we, here we have a few different uh, samples of that. Uh, when you talk about uh, 3D printing and where it really pays off, picture all of those really complex geometries. Uh, if you've classically machined something out of aluminum and you have multiple operations and it's really difficult to do, um, what if you were to just print it? And that's really the approach that we've taken uh, Across our whole farm, uh, we're using uh, ABS, PETG, TPU, uh, some ASA. Um, uh, Polymaker has been a really good uh, partner for us there on the materials side. But uh, these are all engineering grades of plastic that hold their shape. Um, at the same time, you need a hot end that's able to provide uh, the temperature consistencies uh, that you're looking for for that repeatability. Now, we see some nice photos here that are also showing that you don't have to just stop at the printed part, uh, putting in brass inserts, using polymer bushings, uh, we're even 3D printing retaining clips and these components shown uh, are all ways to take that 3D printed part to the next level. You don't have to use 3D printed threads. You're able to put in things like inserts uh, to modify those components. Um, we produce many different geometries. These are just a few. Uh, we will see on the next slide here uh, kind of a specialty use of one of the things Lulzbot's really good at, uh, and that's printing in flexibles. Uh, when you do a TPU material, uh, maybe it's SEBS, a uh, lot of different options that are out there, but it's uh, an area that Lulzbot excels at. Um, 2.85 millimeter filament is part of the key to why we do uh, such a good job there. Um, it's maybe not the most uh, popular, in terms of all the different color varieties and such, uh, but as far as industrial use and then definitely flexibles, um, we uh, have found that it's very, very good um, in our applications. Partnering with uh, Dan's team, uh, all of the tool heads that we've developed, uh, which are interchangeable, feature direct drive extruders. Uh, it's very common to do Bowden drive where your extruder motor is mounted to the frame and then you push the filament through a tube until it gets to the hot end. Well, direct drive extrusion, you put that extruder right above the hot end. Uh, so you have very good control when it comes to both extrusion and retraction. Um, coming up, and as well as what's on the website, we're releasing our newest series of tool heads. Uh, 
these uh, feature the slice engineering across the board. Uh, it's that uh, photo on the right. You can see packaged units ready to go, but it's the uh, Galaxy series tool heads. Uh, we feature a meteor, an asteroid, and a twin nebula. Those are the three main names. The meteor is available in both 285 and in 175. Uh, so if you have a preference, don't fret. Both can be bolted to the Lulzbot chassis. Um, the asteroid is available only in 285. Uh, it comes from the factory with a 1.2 millimeter nozzle, and then uh, we'll be soon releasing a 2.4 uh, millimeter nozzle upgrade pack, uh, which really allows you to put out a, a lot of plastic. That uh, high flow and volumetric um, capability is something that uh, Lulzbot has been able to deliver as well. Uh, with slice. So another thing that we've been working on is uh, kind of taking our experience from print farms and going on the road. Um, by installing turnkey uh, Lulzbot uh, print farms uh, across the country, uh, one of the things that we're able to do is address that um, uh, small piece of the pie that additive manufacturing has in terms of greater manufacturing. Uh, these are low cost systems. Our location in the US is suited perfect for us to uh, be able to ship a system, send a team out, do the installation, teach you how to use it, and have a fully integrated setup. Um, right now, there's not really a lot of things like this. Uh, you might be interacting with individual printers, trying to keep up with production. Um, we figured if we can take the uh, the information that we've learned uh, running our 300 uh, plus printers on average with two, maybe three people um, and condensing that down into uh, turnkey solutions. Um, that it's a nice next step for manufacturing uh, using these printers. Take a look at the next. Go ahead. All right, thanks, John. Appreciate that. Uh, so in summary, we, as you've heard from both John and I, really there's some things that you can do to improve the reliability and the performance of going from a spool of filament to a final product that works, has the quality that you want, the repeatability that you want. Uh, and a lot of it comes down to this material selection component design optimization, making sure that your design works for the process, uh, making sure that the equipment that you specified and the controls that come along with that equipment fit what you need, right? And then finally, that know-how, that education piece, which you know, coming to a webinar like this obviously helps to increase that, uh, that know-how. So I uh, just wanna say thanks from both myself and from John. We've got some contact information there and uh, you can see kind of what we're about. And I think now I'm handing it back over to Jason for our Q&A. All right, thanks Dan and John, great presentation. Uh, all right, so we'll now head into the Q&A session. Uh, if you do have uh, any questions for our presenters and you haven't already done so, please enter them into the chat. Uh, we do have a couple to get started with. So first question, uh, how much of a problem is filamer Fil filament diameter variation, if any. You want to take that one, John? Sure. Yeah, so uh, filament diameter variation, I think largely varies depending on who uh, the manufacturer is. Uh, you'll find that some manufacturers do a much better job uh, of looking at overall uh, filament diameter as well as ovality. Uh, generally, they're checking for both with lasers. Uh, some have taken to putting this on a label or putting this on a QR code on the side of the spool. I think that's really a nice touch. Um, but really, the second part of your question is um, how what the overall uh, diameter of the filament is in terms of 175 or 285. Uh, if you look at a stacking tolerance or the overall size, um, on 175, I would say uh, diameter variance is... Uh, a lot bigger factor than 285. It's a factor in both, but uh, 285 uh, tends to muscle through it a little bit more uh, from what I've seen. And I, I would echo John's point about buying from a reputable company. 
there are certainly over the last five or six years, there has been a general improvement in quality of filament put out there in terms of the diameter and, and ovality. But I still, uh, I would not try to save five dollars on your spool of filament <laughs> only to to jam your printer and cause yourself fifty or a hundred dollars worth of headaches. So uh, buying from a good quality, reputable brand, ideally, as John mentioned, ones that have quality uh, control listed on their website or listed on the individual spool, those are great things to have. All right, thank you very much. All right, let's go on to the next one. So do, let's see, do the peak cervical imprints get absorbed by the body or only become integrated into the bone? Yeah, so it's an, it's an osteointegration uh, process. Uh, the implant is also coated in uh, what's called a hydroxyapatite or HA, um, which is essentially most of the mineral that bone is made out of is, is hydroxyapatite. And so yeah, it's fully osteointegrated, but because of the way the osteointegration happens, you end up matching the mechanical properties of the native bone. So yeah, I, the body does not fully resorb it. I, I misspoke if I, um, if I said that. Uh, yeah, it is fully integrated. And then the mechanical properties become identical basically between the native bone and the implant, which creates a... Um, uh, you're essentially not creating a stress riser in the in the spinal column, which prevents breakdown of subsequent layers. All right, thank you. Okay, let's go on to our, I think this is our final question. And once again, if you do have further questions, please enter them in the chat. Uh, we have a couple minutes, so we could go on to a couple more. Uh, does Slice Engineering make custom print heads for Prusa printers as well? Yes, we do. Yeah, we have a number of custom print heads for a variety of, of different machines. Uh, obviously we build them for Lulzbot. We also build them for a number of other companies uh, ranging from pretty inexpensive models that you can buy on Amazon uh, all the way up to multi-thousand dollar um, systems that uh, go on things like medical 3D printers that are validated for FDA uh, by the FDA. All right, thank you, yeah, Dan. You can find the Prusa systems uh, on our website, sliceengineering.com. All right, great. All right, and then last question. Do you do any incoming inspection yourself on that filament diameter or the ovality? Sure, I'll maybe chime in on this one. Uh, typically, if things are working well, uh, it's more of a spot check. I wouldn't say that this is uh, by any means inspecting every spool, but if you do start to see strange things, uh, maybe Per layer, you notice that the part is um, expanding or contracting. It, it may cause you to take a, a look at that spool and then maybe take a look at a batch number that you've received uh, if you're questioning, um, especially in a, a farm use. Um, that could prompt you to talk to your filament manufacturer uh, about a specific batch. Um, yeah. That's, that's more of what I'd say is an as needed. Uh, if things are coming out nicely, uh, you've got good smooth uh, print results, um, it's not uh, as much of a concern. But if you start to see issues, there's certainly ways to communicate that to the manufacturer of your filament. All right, thank you very much. I think we might have one more coming in here. Uh, kind of to build on what John was saying, we don't go through nearly the volume that John's team does. But when we do see a an issue with uh, filament that's out of spec, either due to print results or, or jamming sometimes, uh, but most of the time what we're seeing is actually wet filament, not necessarily a variation in diameter. So we make sure that if we're, if we're running uh, a print, we always dry our filament first. Uh, it'd be, uh, especially in Florida. If you live in any any place humid, <laughs> you should definitely be drying your filament uh, before you run, run a, especially a long print. All right, thanks. Let's see, and 
All right, a last question. Would you be interested in an aftermarket device that controls deposition rate due to filament diameter variation? I think the advent of sensors and 3D printers is going to be a whole new wave of improvement. Uh, I think that there are some great companies out there that have been uh, studying these types of effects. Um, the varying diameter of the filament um, might be part of it, but I, I would look at ovality as well and um, really try to study what's your, your volumetric throughput so that what's coming in and what's going out is what you're looking at. Because if you're saying the overall diameter got squished, but it got wider at the same time, then the actual volume of filament that's passing through your hot end is, is still going to be relatively the same. Um, but there, there's the, it's a deeper question, but I think the long-term solution is going to be that uh, machines do need more sensors, and those sensors are going to provide a lot of intelligence uh, when it comes to laying down particular layers and having those layers be what you're expecting, um, as opposed to being blind to that uh, printing process uh, like so many of the machines are uh, currently. Yeah, I'd agree with that. We uh, would love to see more sensors on machines. All right, thanks, gentlemen. All right, well, I think that's going to wrap up the Q&A and uh, therefore we'll wrap up today's TRX webinar series. I would like to thank once again, uh, Dan and John. Great presentation, guys. Uh, if you do have further questions for them, you can reach out to them directly. Their uh, contact information is on the screen here. So there will be a, a post survey webinar going or a post webinar survey going out to all those who participated. We do really appreciate the time you take to provide America makes feedback so we may continue to improve and strengthen the additive community. And as a reminder, if you think you or your organization would be interested in sharing on the TRX webinar series. And on the I'm sorry, on the TRX webinar series, you can fill out the uh, form on the website or you can reach out to myself, Jason Thomas directly. Thanks everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks everybody for coming.